I love this part, talking about not trying to check yourself on obsessing over what people are going to say. Um, when we flee in the direction of comfort or raising no eyebrows, of standing in the back of the room instead of the front, what we are fleeing is opportunity. You go on. They will laugh at you. Losers have always gotten together in little groups and talked about winners. The hopeless have always mocked the hopeful. The scared do their best to convince the brave. There's no point in trying. I love that. That I try to think of it like this. Why would I pay any attention to those who wish to bathe in my reflective light? <laughs> that, the, that why would I well let said. them dim the light? Right, like that's that's what they want. So I remember uh, thinking one time, uh, these people don't work hard enough for me to care about their opinion. Um, so it's very easy for uh, people who are not busy doing things to come up with creative, even uh, hurtful uh, things to say about the people who are busy doing things. This is what's so great about, you know, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, man in the arena speech. You know, are you a person in the arena? If you are, you're going to have to listen to the crowd. Uh, if you're not, then you can safely sit in the stands and shout whatever you want about the person in the mm -hmm. arena. And uh, I think you make a good point earlier that 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 these things can be uh, particularly difficult for women. Uh, obviously, different genders, different ethnicities, different cultures, people from different backgrounds sort of are taught different uh, lessons early on about what their role is and and uh, how this is supposed to go. But I think generally. We, we need people who have the courage to be themselves. Like each one of us is born with a totally unique set of DNA that has never before existed and never will exist again. It's tragic that you would throw that away, or as you said, dim the light of that um, to be more like other people. We already have lots of other people. We have zero other instances of you. You should have the courage to be that person. And don't worry about them calling you different or difficult. I like this too. It's good to be difficult. The well-behaved rarely make history. I love that. It was a personal trainer I met at one gym I was at one time, and he he knew of me, but he didn't know any. And and uh, he kind of came over with a smile, and he goes, "Only the lions are remembered." <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, that. There there's a story about Margaret Thatcher. She's before she enters politics, she's a chemist and she's trying to get a job at this chemical company. And she can see what the interviewer is writing upside down. Like she can see it from across and she she makes out upside down the man writing. This woman is much too difficult to work here. <laughs> and uh, you know what? The guy was right. She obviously was too difficult to work there. That would have been way too small of a place for yes. someone of her personality, temperament, drive, ambition, and uh, and you know uh, skill set. So, uh, is is it going to be easy being difficult? No. And and are people going to accuse you of being difficult? Of course. But if you went along with everything, you wouldn't do anything special or unique. That's the that's the trick of it. Yes. Honestly, I was just talking to Gad Sad, a, a professor in Canada, and I love him. And he was saying one of his regrets is he wished he had gotten along better with people higher on the totem pole than he is at his university. He wished he could sort of kiss up a little better than he can because he thinks he maybe would whatever he would have done better in sure. the university system. And I was saying to him, absolutely not, because you now have such a huge platform. His podcast is doing well. Everybody listens to him. He's got a big social media presence and he's super fun to talk to and to listen to in part because he's irascible. You know, if he had, yes. if he'd made it in the university system, he probably wouldn't have all those sharp edges and he probably wouldn't be able to speak so freely. Yeah, maybe he would have been promoted. Maybe he'd have published more academic texts, but he probably wouldn't have the podcast. He probably wouldn't be on your show. Um, I, I wrote a lot in the book about Frank Serpico, who I think is a sort of timely figure to study now as we're having this reckoning about police and their role in society. And um, as he's being uh, prepared to be cross, as he's being prepared for, for one of the trials that he's a whistleblower in, uh, a witness in, uh, the DA says to him, like, why are you so difficult? Why can't you just cooperate? And he says, you know, if I cooperated, if I just went along with what everyone wanted, I'd be taking bribes in the precinct right now. The mm -hmm. whole point is that I do what I think is right. The point is I'm difficult to work with. That's what got me here. And mm -hmm. I think we have to remember that if we if we go along with what everyone wants, things will, might be easier, but we're certainly not going to break much in the way of new ground. 
And I also just, I keep coming back to this, but I feel like I've lived it. So I want people to remember, even if it doesn't work out short term, let's say you're difficult and they're like, well, let's get rid of her. She's a pain in the ass to your point about Margaret Thatcher. That's good. Then you'll land someplace that sees the value in the real you. And you're never going to succeed and do well at a place that feels differently about that. You know, Margaret Thatcher wasn't going to do well at that chemist place um, at that lab because they were honest about how they felt. So you'll naturally land where you need to land if you keep testing the limits and just being adhering to your true self. When I, I talked about this a little earlier when I was uh, mentioning the, the conclusion of the book, that, that I sort of see this thing unethical at work. I don't want to be a part of it. I am not a part of it, but I, I, I don't escalate it as much as I should. I decide not to get particularly involved in what's happening. Uh, my concern was, as the concern of a lot of people, is I didn't want to lose my job, right? This is a concern we have. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to get a reputation. I don't want to be difficult, et cetera. But, you know, again, with the, the benefit of hindsight or, or, or maturity or age, it's sort of like, why was I so intent on keeping a job that you could lose by doing what is obviously mm -hmm. the right thing? Mm -hmm. And so we are, we're so often concerned about the bad thing happening as if the status quo is perfect. The status quo has problems. Uh, and it may well be that you've come to the end of the road there and you have to do this thing that is risky and dangerous and scary and might not work out perfectly. Um, but wherever you land, whatever you do next um, is liable to be better because at least it's not whatever this broken thing is. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about that? Because what's the difference sure. between giving up and having the courage to leave? It's tricky, right? Uh, whistleblowers could obviously just quit and go work somewhere else. Um, there is a certain amount of courage as well to say like, why should I have to go? I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I'm going to stand up and fight for this. Um, you know, Martin Luther King could have moved to New York City, uh, safely ensconced himself in sort of liberal American life at that time, not uh, been beaten by the police, not been assassinated. He, he may well have still been able to affect change through his writings and his speeches. Um, but he said, no, I have to go back down into the valley. He says, I can't be a coward who runs away. So there's a tension here. I'm not saying you should always leave. You should always stay. Uh, but we need people who are have the courage not just to say something's wrong, not just to object to it, but also to, to stand to stand and fight. Mm -hmm. But you do write about sort of don't don't quit, don't be a quitter. And yet it all you also recognize the courage it may take to leave a situation that's not working for you. And I think a lot of people battle with this, right? Like they don't want to just give up on a difficult situation. But you get to this point where you realize this is no longer good for me. Or I just you point. I thought this is a great point. I just need change in my life. There was a line in your book. Uh, I wrote it down. Um, uh, uh, hold on. It's pretty certain that continuing to do the same thing in the same way in the same place over and over is not just insanity, but eventually a form of cowardice. I, too, agree with that. Well, look, in a marriage, right, sometimes it takes courage to stay and try to fix this thing. And sometimes it takes courage to say, this thing has run its course. We are two different people. We are not meant to be together. And this is true for jobs. This is true for a book. You could work every day for three years on a book and then realize the premise is flawed. Right. So I think the question is, is quitting the easy thing or the hard thing? And maybe that's the test. Right. Mm. Are you quitting so you don't have to do it anymore? Or are you quitting because you are going to do the harder thing, which, again, may be deciding to file for divorce. It may be uh, quitting and having to start over and walk away from a retirement package or stock options or 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 whatever it is. Right. Um, is quitting the easy thing or the hard thing? We go back to the choice of Hercules. The hard choice is the one we want to go towards.